So we've been working our way through the epistle of James, and this is the 12th message in the series. And this particular message is about patience and endurance. And I suspect that we've all had to practice patience at some time in our life, so we're familiar with that. And of course, we've all had to endure some things. And some of you may be thinking, well, I have to endure your messages every Sunday, so... And this is the 12th one in this series, so uh, yeah, we know about enduring. James shares his wisdom about patience and endurance. And he does it today by introducing two ideas. One is very earthly and practical, and the other is heavenly and spiritual. The heavenly and spiritual one is about Jesus' second coming. Jesus coming again in the clouds. The earthly and practical one is an illustration of a farmer. So listen to the Word of God in James this morning. I'll begin by reading James 5, verses 7 and 8. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. So one of the fundamental teachings of the Christian church is that Christ will return again. We say it in the Apostles' Creed, but we believe it in our heart. It's not optional. The first time Jesus came, He was born in a manger as a helpless infant baby. But the second time He comes, He will come as a conquering King. And here's one thing I can guarantee each and every one of you. Jesus is coming back in your lifetime. Does that seem like a bold claim to make? Well, it's true. Either Jesus is going to come back for us all at once, at one time, or He will come for you individually. When you draw your last breath, either way, you will see him in your lifetime. And James reminds us that he's coming, and it's near. You know, life is short. We think about your life. Some of us may feel like we're a little bit closer to that moment than others. But you know, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you can't ever tell. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow, let alone the very next breath. And James reminds us, and he says, be patient while you wait. Farmers understand patience. They, they see, they practice patience and they see it for what it really is. Good farmers are not lazy. They're some of the hardest workers you will ever find. And yet a good farmer realizes that there are some things that they can control and many things that they cannot control. A farmer decides what seeds they're going to plant. That's within their control. And they can control how they prepare the soil. They can control the fertilizer that they put down. They can decide how long they're going to let the crop grow, how and when to harvest it. But there are many things they cannot control. A farmer cannot control the rain. And as much as farming has become a science, there is still something very artistic about it, very mysterious about it. And the farmer sees, perhaps more than anyone else, that there is a higher power working beyond themselves, controlling how their fields grow. Sometimes they may do everything right, but it just doesn't work. Sometimes they might do everything wrong, and it does work. And so the farmer learns to trust. The farmer learns to be patient. They know when it's time to work. And when it's time to work, you work hard. And you work smart. And when it's time to wait, you are patient. And you wait. And waiting is not lazy, it often means preparing so that when 
when, it, when you are ready to work, when the harvest comes, you're ready to work because you've done the preparation while you were waiting. And a good farmer demonstrates great faith. They trust that the harvest will come. Otherwise, why would they bother with all the hard work of planting and tending their fields? They don't do that out of a sense of, of having no hope. No, they're hopeful. They work with, with a, a, a hope in their heart that this harvest is going to be good and it's going to be valuable. And it's all going to be worth it. All this hard work is going to be worth it. It's going to pay off in the end. And the Word of God says, Jesus is coming. He's coming in your lifetime. Either He will come for us all at once, or He will come for you personally when you take your final breath. And James says, be patient. It doesn't mean be lazy. It doesn't mean do nothing. Because there are things we need to do. Like a farmer tending his fields, you need to tend the business of your life. And you need to be wise. And you need to tend the things that matter. The things that lead to a fruitful harvest in your life. Not to waste and want. And don't be discouraged by the troubles that you must endure. Christ will come and he will make everything that is wrong right again. On the, the final day, his kingdom will come on earth and his will will be done on earth too. Now remember that James wrote these words to a Christian community who had suffered great persecution. Many of them been chased out of their homes, chased out of town, because they believed and proclaimed that Jesus was the Lord and the Messiah. Some of them had lost everything. Some of them had lost their homes, their jobs, their businesses. Some of them even lost loved ones who were thrown in jail for believing in Jesus, or who had even been murdered. But the word of God to them is the same as it is to us. Be patient. Trust the Lord. Jesus is coming. And then James goes on in, verses, in verse 9. He says, Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. In our patience, we remember that Jesus is watching. So we don't just grit and bear it. No, we actually are called to live with joy. In the midst of trials and sufferings, we know that it might look dark right now, but Jesus has already won. We live lives of joy and love. We can sing and celebrate like we do in our worship service. We can be like the disciples who just one month after seeing their Lord brutally executed, they saw him buried in a borrowed tomb. <coughs> and one month later, they boldly preached his resurrection in the temple courtyards, in the courtyards of the ones who had had him murdered. And their joy and their excitement was so authentic. Hundreds and thousands of people believed their message and became believers too. Are you being joyful in your patience and in your endurance? I want you to hear me today. Whatever you're facing, God is doing something in your life. Your weight is not in vain. The fact that you are waiting means that God is doing something. And if you're puzzled because your waiting doesn't seem to make any sense, then maybe it confirms even more the fact that your waiting will end with a tremendous, miraculous movement of God. So don't lose heart. Don't grumble. Be patient. Rest in the joy of the Lord. Celebrate His goodness 
in anticipation of what He's going to reveal to you. Because, if, because especially if you have been living for the Lord and you're trying to listen to His voice and follow what He's telling you to do and you find you're still having to wait, you're waiting, you're waiting and you don't understand why, I have seen it too many times in my own life or in the lives of others that we didn't understand why we were going through what we were going through until after the fact. God was moving this person here and this part over there. And at the end of it all, he brought it together in such creative ways that we never could have even understood. We never could have came up with that on our own. We knew it was the Lord that did it. And it was a wonderful thing that the Lord has done. And we need to remember that when we find ourselves in those times when we're waiting, maybe even suffering and having to endure, remember God is doing something. And you're going to be amazed when you see what he has done. So don't wait until then to celebrate. Go ahead and celebrate now. Celebrate his goodness in anticipation of what he will reveal to you. And then in verses 10 through 12, James says, For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him in the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. And he pulls out this example of Job. And you remember how Job had lost everything. He lost everything. And he suffered greatly. And he had to endure. But he always kept the faith. He never gave up on God. He kept the faith. And in the end, he was restored seven times what he had had before. And James' words here remind us that we are not alone when we must wait and suffer and endure. The prophets of the Bible who came before us also suffered. They were righteous, faithful people. But they were often rejected by the world and suffered because of it. Jeremiah is one that we think of. Jeremiah was known as a weeping prophet. Not, because, not only because his people threw him in a well, but also because they persecuted him simply for saying the truth saying the truth and he had to endure watching his people suffer being conquered by the babylonians dragged off into exile but he also knew that he had a reason to weep but he had a reason to be joyful because he could see a time when the lord would restore his people and no longer would they just follow legal words from the old testament law but god would write a new covenant on their heart He would teach them His Word and teach them to love, and He would restore all people through the coming Messiah. So if you are suffering, don't jump to the conclusion that God is angry with you. If you are trying to live for Him, if you are a follower of Christ and you've given your life to Him and you're seeking to follow Him with all your heart, it doesn't guarantee that you won't suffer. And it doesn't mean that God is angry with you. If you are living the way God wants you to live, be encouraged because sometimes God's people suffer. But God will use that suffering to refine you. And God will make it all right one day. So trust Him. Trust Him and be patient. And James 5.12, it says, But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or by earth Or anything else, just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. These words here of James echo the words of Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus and James were brothers. They grew up in the same household of Mary and Joseph. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Do not make vows. And he said, just say a simple yes, I will, or no, 
I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. And I could preach a whole sermon about that. But for today, let me just keep it simple so we can finish up. The point is we need to live our lives with authenticity and integrity so that our word is our bond. What's the point in saying things like, I swear to God, or I swear on my mother's grave, or anything like that? Why would we use those useless expressions to try to convince people that we're speaking the truth? If you live with integrity, people will know who you are, and they will know that they can trust you, and they will see your life, and they will trust your word. So live with integrity. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. As we close today, I want you to reflect on what God's word has said to you today. What has God said to you in the scripture and in this message? Take a moment to consider. How can you apply this teaching about patience and endurance in your own life? Is there a situation where you need to trust God more? To wait patiently? Or to act with faith like a farmer tending his fields? Or perhaps you feel called to let go of something you can't control. Or to work diligently in the areas of your life where it will make a difference. Maybe you need to find joy in the waiting. Trusting that God is at work even when you cannot see it. Or perhaps today it may come to your attention that You don't know for sure if you really are a believer. You're not sure if you really are a Christian that's following Jesus Christ. Perhaps the Lord is speaking to you about that today. Today you may need to make a decision. Are you going to follow Christ or not? If the Lord is laying that on your heart, I would love to speak with you, help you, Find out. Make a decision. It's the best decision you'll ever make because I can guarantee you this. Every single one of us in here is going to have to meet Jesus one day. And you need to be sure that you're ready. Because it's going to happen in your lifetime. Let's take a few moments to pray silently. And then I will close us. Lord God, grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change, the courage to change the things that we can, and the wisdom to know the difference as we wait patiently and endure the trials of this life. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.